Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will focus on a new book by City University of New York Professor um, Eric Weitz entitled A World Divi Divided, The Global Struggle for Human Rights in the Age of um, Nation States. Joining us this afternoon will be Harvard's Catherine Sickink, who will provide comments on the book. Before we open it, uh, open the floor to all of you. I'm Christian Osterman, delighted uh, to chair, co-chair, as always, the seminar with Eric Arneson of George Washington University, who directs the National History Center. This seminar, the Washington History Seminar, is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and the National History Center of the American Historical Association. Today's session is co-sponsored by the Wilson Center's Rule of Law Initiative. We're currently in our 10th year of holding these sessions. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals to help, who have produced this event, Pete Biersecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. We'd like to thank our two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University Department of History. We also like to thank a number of individual donors who make these meetings possible and whose rank we invite you, all of you, to join. Details about how to do so are available in the chat room, in the chat function right now. Today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our organization's respective websites. For the Q&A part of the seminar, we'll get to it about the halfway point, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom room if you would like to ask a question. Once you press the button, you will we'll be entered into a queue and when the moderator calls on you, you will receive a prompt that will ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, please do so and then um, please ask your question short and succinct. You may also submit questions to Rachel Wheatley by email provided in the chat function. We apologize in advance for all of those that we cannot get to. We usually get a large number of questions, so apologies ahead of time. And with that, I'd like to now turn over the Zoom room to my co-chair, Eric Arneson. Eric, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce our speakers today for our seminar on Eric D. Weitz's recent book, A World Divided, The Global Struggle for Human Rights in the Age of Nation States. Eric Weitz is Distinguished Professor of History at City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He is the author of multiple books, Weimar Germany, Promise and Tragedy, A Century of Genocide, Utopias of Race and Nation, in creating German communism, 1890 to 1990, and most recently on the subject of today's discussion, A World Divided, which appeared in print earlier this year. All four books are published by Princeton University Press. He lectures widely in public and in academic settings on the histories of genocide and human rights uh, and on Weimar Germany. Eric will lead us off today with some remarks about the book to be followed by a comment by Catherine Sissing, who I will introduce in a short while. And with that, I turn the screen over to Eric Weitz. Eric. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks especially to Eric and Christian, as well as Rachel and Peter for, for organizing this. And thanks so much to Catherine for agreeing to serve as the discussant. Up until a few years ago, Catherine and I were colleagues at the University of Minnesota. I learned a great deal from her about human rights. I continue to learn a great deal from her and I'm, I'm very, very grateful to her. A World Divided is a global history and a history of human rights. Three issues animate the book. First, in our world of 193 nation states at last count, who truly, quote unquote, has the right to have rights, as Hannah Arendt asked in 1951 in The Origins of Totalitarianism, and a century before her, the German Enlightenment philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte proclaimed much the same thing, that the most basic right, said Fichte, is the right to have rights. 
Second issue that animates the book, what do we mean by human rights? We tend to think that the answer is simple. It is anything but. Third issue, how do we actually obtain rights? We honor heroic actors, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but is it by their actions alone that we make progress when we make progress and we don't always do, excuse me, do, but when we make progress in the realm of human rights? So these three issues are the fundamental ones that I address in the book. The book moves through nine historical cases over the last 250 years to illuminate these problems, cases drawn from virtually every continent. The book starts with the Greek struggle for independence from the Ottoman Empire in the 1820s, moves on to the removal of Native Americans from Minnesota, goes on to slavery and emancipation in Brazil, the creation of minorities. Minorities, a phenomenon of the nation state, in namely Armenians and Jews, then genocide and the rebuilding of shattered communities in Namibia, Korean movements for independence and democracy, the Soviet Union, Palestine, Israel, Rwanda and Burundi in regard to decolonization and independence. Underlying all these cases, all three issues, is again the fact that we live in a world in which the nation state has become the predominant political form with origins along the Atlantic seaboard in the 18th century, then its dissemination through Europe in the 19th century, and its movement to a global phenomenon in the post-1945 world. At the same time, while the book is very much about nation states, at the same time, at least since the 18th century, we have lived in a global and transnational world in which not only people, but ideas, movements, phenomena like human rights travel as well. The nation state, we know, and I think this won't be a surprise to anyone on this Zoom event, the nation state lives on inclusions and exclusions. Even though since 1945, we have built a global human rights system, the nation state is still the first port of call for people demanding their rights. At the same time, the nation state is the supreme violator of rights. So just to take the first case as an example, the decade long war that the Greeks still honor as the war of independence against the Ottoman Empire, a war that led to a semi-sovereign state and that enfranchised some property owning men. Those wars in the 1820s also devastated the Muslim and Jewish populations of the Peloponnese as Greek so-called liberators fought to create the nation state. Who is a Greek? That question animated rebels in the 1820s and continues to resonate in Greece <coughs> this very day. The answer with some modifications today is still a Greek is a person who is an adherent of the Greek Orthodox Church. What does that mean then for Muslims, Jews, and other minorities, Bulgarians, Fox, Macedonians, others in the Greek nation state? In contrast to empires, which you know, were by no means democratic or egalitarian, in contrast to empires, nonetheless, the nation state in its first post-Napoleonic creation here in Greece in the 1820s, drove people out as much as it included people, limiting the circle of rights-bearing citizens. And I argue throughout the book that those limitations, as well as the enabling of rights, when we are fortunate enough to live in democratic systems, 
Those exclusions are as much a feature of the nation state as the inclusions. The 19th century marked an epic period of population movement spurred on by the transatlantic slave trade despite the prohibitions that began to develop after 1807 the Atlantic slave trade, as well as the search for opportunities, Europe, Europeans coming to the settler colonies around the globe, uh, Asians and Middle Easterners also moving around the globe in search of empires, all of this enabled by the new technologies of steamships and railroads. Knowledge and ideas traveled as well. Enslaved Brazilians and slave owners, to use another example from the book, were acutely aware of the Haitian slave revolt of the 1790s. The Brazilian elite lived in a constant state of anxiety, while enslaved people had a model they could replicate, and replicate they did engaging in countless rebellions and establishing numerous maroon communities. That popular movement, while often ideologically inchoate, nonetheless attacked the, mo the preeminent violation of human rights in the 19th century, namely the existence of chattel slavery. The abolition of slavery in Brazil was then fundamentally dependent upon the rebellions and escapes that enslaved peoples engaged in throughout the 19th century. The formal abolitionist movement had close ties to the international anti-slavery movement headquartered in London. The economics of slavery had by the 1860s, 1870s, made slavery in much of the country not a profitable enterprise. But those two factors alone could not by themselves lead to the abolition of slavery. It required a popular movement of enslaved people. And that argument also runs through all the cases of the book, that when we have had advances in human rights, they have come through the confluence, a fragile confluence, I call it, of popular movements, state interests, and the workings of the international community. But what do we actually mean by human rights? Another issue that animates the book. In the 19th century, rights were largely the preserve of property white men in the West. They were liberal in character in the sense of security of property, rights of representation, and free speech, and so on. The struggles of so many people around the globe led to a great expansion of those allowed into the charmed circle of rights-bearing citizens, women and Blacks, prime examples. I address the issue of the expansion of women's rights in, in, in the conclusion of the book. The chapter on Namibia in particular deals with the ultimate uh, winning of human rights by Namibians against apartheid South Africa. But formal citizenship and a purely liberal concept of rights do not address the severe inequalities that reign and continue to reign and make the actual exercise of rights nearly difficult, if not impossible, for so many people around the globe. At least since 1966, and the UN Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, our understanding of human rights have expanded far beyond the liberal conception that reigned in the 19th century. And there were critics, or in the 19th century, even liberal critics of a purely political definition of rights. I address the issue of social, economic, and cultural rights in, uh, especially in the chapters on Korea, the sections on North Korea, and the Soviet Union. 
and in, in a, a, a odd kind of way, perhaps. In both countries and in other communist countries in the post-1945 period, the reigning argument of those states was that they exercised a more expansive, greater understanding of human rights than the Western states with their purely political concept of human rights. They argued that communist societies provide employment, housing, social security, and they prevailed in the realm of social and economic rights. Well and good. However, the level of provisions was very, very low, needless to say. And those states also exercise exclusions based on political and sometimes ethnic and national origins. In fact, the provisioning of social security, housing, anything we call social and economic rights, the provisioning any two-bit dictatorship with a half-functioning economy can carry out. Those are not rights. And in those, in, in, in those two chapters, I argue that that, can, that limited conception of social and economic rights, in fact, points up the, comprehensive, the need for a comprehensive understanding of rights, for the intertwining of political, social, and economic rights, that uh, a, a developed understanding of, of rights that I think we do have today, at least uh, among those who favor human rights, is that those kinds of rights are interlinked, intertwined, and to be really meaningful, there have to be political rights that go along with social and economic rights. Rights means that people have the right to, indeed, uh, are, it is demanded of them that they protest as need be, whatever their concerns may be, whether it be housing or education or any other kind of social and economic, as well as political rights. Ultimately, a world divided is an affirmative history, not a triumphalist history, but an affirmative history of human rights. It engages the contradictions, partial advances, and retreats in the history of human rights. Still, it argues that human rights are our best hope for the future. The advocates sometimes espouse utopian aspirations. I don't think that's very helpful, actually. A restrained perspective is more appropriate and effective. Human rights will never be implemented in the all-embracing fashion of, say, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. Human rights will always face opponents, some quite strong. Yet human rights provide a powerful affirmation of the human spirit. They require that people be respected and afforded recognition, no matter what their specific gender, nationality, or race. They demand that everyone have access to the basic necessities of life and have the freedom to express themselves, to work and build and create as they wish, to join with others as they desire, and not least, of course, to be free of the scourge of violence, and forced displacement. Those are our fundamental human rights, and we should demand nothing less from the worlds we inhabit. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eric. We now have a comment from Professor Catherine Sickink, who is the Ryan Family Professor of Human Rights Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School a scholar of international norms and institutions, transnational advocacy networks, the impact of human rights law and policies and trans transitional justice. She's the author of The Hidden Face of Rights Towards a Politics of Responsibilities, Evidence for Hope Making Human Rights Work in the 21st Century, and the award-winning The Justice Cascade, How Human Rights Prosecutions Are Changing World Politics. Catherine, the screen is yours.
So first, I want to thank uh, uh, um, Eric and Christian and, uh, and Eric for the invitation to be in this event today. Um, second, since no one has held up the book, I feel like someone here should hold up the book, and I hope you can see it on my camera. You see, okay, you see this is a hefty <laughs> tome. Um, I should point out that I am a, a political scientist, not a historian. I do international relations. I'm a political scientist that has a long uh, tried to have a, a, a deep appreciation of history in my own research and the research of others. And I've followed human rights history uh, carefully. Uh, and uh, so as you see from uh, this, from Eric's introduction, this is a compelling and sweeping human rights history. And uh, when I'm sometimes asked if I can only recommend one book that people should read on human rights history, I now tell them they should read uh, Eric's book. Um, and it's, it's wide ranging. It is meticulously researched. It takes a much longer a slice of history than most human rights histories do. Um, and it has this very detailed uh, case material, I think, that illuminates uh, the argument. Um, and so, you know, and as Eric ended with, this book is, is about the fact that uh, there's no finality to human rights, that as Eric says at one point, only ceaseless debate and political contestation. And that very much uh, reflects, uh, you know, my view of human rights that I always use the word struggle, that it's about, it's about constant struggle. It's not about uh, uh, that we're reaching the end of history. Now, I also want to say, I think this is very much a book that, that builds on a lifetime of research, that Eric's lifetime of research. This is the kind of book that a, that's a, a, a senior scholar can dare to write uh, because it's so ambitious, covering so many parts of the world and so many economic, uh, so many historical periods, uh, but that we really do welcome, I think, uh, people at, this, uh, who, at the, this stage in their career to be able to take on these ambitious, uh, daring books. Um, and so it builds on uh, Eric's earlier work on, on genocide, his book, A Century of Genocide, uh, and, but also very much on um, his work, uh, and I think of this important 2008 American Historical Review article on uh, the, the, from Vienna to the Paris system, uh, international politics and the entangled history of human rights, Deporta forced deportation and civilized emissions. Now, I remember reading that article when it first came out, and it was a revelation to me at the time. And it was a revelation at, to me as a human rights scholar, because people had talked about collective rights kind of in the modern period, about you know, indigenous rights as being collective rights or the right to land versus individual lives. But here was Eric providing this kind of deep historical analysis of a period where collective rights were kind of the first way of thinking about rights uh, as the rights of nations, uh, not as the rights of uh, individuals. And then explaining to us all the problems that that vision of rights could have leading up to some of the the atrocities uh, in World War II. Um, and so this, this, uh, it, this I think, uh, argument also informs parts of the book, importantly informs parts of the book, especially the chapter on uh, minorities, uh, Armenia and, and the Jews, which is a chapter you didn't mention, I think, Eric, in your overview. Um, so uh, so in, in that sense, the, the, I think the book affirms both a, both affirms this, uh, positive history of rights, as Eric said at the end, but very much critiques limitations of rights as well, especially when they're based on national and sometimes racial citizenship, right? Um, and so the book grapples with what, uh, what I've long thought to be the main paradox of human rights, and that is that uh, human rights depends very much on the state and at the same time, it, uh, the state, you know, so the state is the main protector of human rights, but the state is also the main violator of human rights. And we, so we know that the, the, the most vulnerable people in the world are, of course, stateless people, right? And so you, if you're, you never want to be without a state if you want your rights to be protected. Uh, and yet, states have in many cases been a major abusers of rights at the same time. Um, and so, you know, this book is very much about the creation of nation states and the, the exclusions and violence that such creation entails. Uh, now, Eric gives us both a, a global history, a transnational history, a history of the world, and at the same time, 
uh, these, it's, it's grounded in these very particular national realities with each chapter kind of taking on a different, grounding us in a different piece of, na of, of national histories. And I think that's one of the, the things that's really unique and, and a real strength of this book is we're taken deeply into these important national histories and some that we don't hear very much about, whether it be the American removals and the, the Minnesota story he tells uh, uh, that people don't always know, or whether it be the, the Namibian story. So there's a lot of, of new material here that isn't always put together in a human rights history. Okay, well, I want to end just with a, a few points that are partly uh, uh, points, partly questions. Uh, one is that uh, this is sort of a, a discussion that Eric and I had when he was first uh, circulating a manuscript of the book, but but that is, uh, I don't, I still, th I still wonder, Eric, whether the book distinguishes adequately between what I think of uh, the national protection of human rights and the international protection of human rights that really gives us this breaking point at 1948, right? That, that there's a new history of human rights. It's not, it's not an accident that most history of human rights start with the Universal Declaration. And it's because they, there are mainly histories of the international protection of human rights through international institutions, international law. And what you're giving us is very much a history of the national protection of human rights that then layers on to it later, this international protection dimension. Um, as, uh, so as, uh, a second question I have is, is that, is it the state or is it the nation state that's really the, the problem in, in part of this book, right? And, and I think uh, that, uh, that you mean to say that states will always have trouble respecting the rights of their citizens. Uh, and particularly of non-citizens, but the nation state has an exaggerated problem uh, with this. Um, and, uh, and then the third, um, the third question I wanted to ask is that almost all of this, the, the case studies you use are states that are authoritarian states or, or, or quite authoritarian states, semi-authoritarian, or in some kind of uneasy transition to being more democratic. And so I guess the, the third and final question I'd ask you with is, is it, is it the, you know, the, the, the issue here is partly states, but it's partly authoritarian, uh, these, these nationalist uh, authoritarian states. Uh, and whether, or, you know, what, what difference is democracy really making to the story you tell as more countries in the world, even with a democracy being under uh, critique, uh, we do see that uh, we have more democracies in the world. And so is that uh, then in the period you were writing about before, is that, is that, does that make a difference at all for the story that you tell? So I think I'll end there because I know there's gonna be a lot of questions in the audience. Thank you very, very much. Eric, did you wanna to respond to some of what Catherine said? Um, yeah, if that's okay. Uh, yes, yes. First, I want to thank you for <laughs> the, the, the very nice comments. Um, some of the nicest comments I've, I, I've received about the book. Um, so, so you know, I'm great. I'm grateful for that. Um, well, as as Catherine, as you well know, that you know there are these these debates when. When do we begin? Can we begin talking about human rights? And you know, one of the most prominent books in the, in the field by Sam Moynes is the 1970s. Others say 1990s. Uh, on on on. I, you know, I I I didn't want in the book to go into a lot of back and forth about that, except to say that, except to argue through the book that I think there's a deep history to human rights. And I start in the late 18th century because that's when I think the idea of rights that you know, emerged um, intellectually in, and philosophically in the uh, seven, uh, 17th century uh, becomes manifest in, in, in politics and life with the American, French, and Latin American revolutions. And to be sure, there are differences. There are differences between the concept of rights that was prevalent in, in, in those revolutions and what we come to understand as rights in the post-1945 period. 
but rather than drawing, erecting walls between these different periods, I was more interested in the continuity. And there are people who even in the 19th century talk, use the phrase human rights. Um, the fact that, uh, as you mentioned, international protections begin to emerge and have since been expanding continually since 1945. And the fact that at least legally under international law, even non-citizens have rights that should be protect protected. All of that I think are constitute great advances in the history and practice of human rights. And I argue in the book that any movement of rights protection to the international level is an advance. But at the same time, at the same time, um, so much of human rights, both positively and the violations, occurs at the nation state level, at the level of national citizens, citizenship. And we see that so powerfully today in, in the existence of over 70 million migrants worldwide by the count of UNHCR. Actually, it was 70 million when I, I wrote the last draft of the book. I haven't looked recently, but it's probably over 80 million by now. And if you listen to uh, some of the evidence about climate change, there are estimates that as many as a billion people, World Bank estimate, that as many as a billion people will be migrants because of climate change. So um, still, still the nation state, it begins with national citizenship. And to the extent that sovereign individual state sovereignty has been partially uh, moved to the international, par par partly limited by the international system, I think that's progress. You know, states, your second question, you know, states, we can't live with them, we can't live without them. Uh, um, but I do think that the nation state is a particular problem rather than multinational empires or small communities, precisely because most nation states put a primacy on issues of racial or national or religious or ethnic belonging or co some combination thereof. That's why I started with the Greek chapter uh, because it was so uh, telling to me that the first post-Napoleonic, already with the first post-Napoleonic state, post-French revolution from post-Napoleonic state, we see this problem. Your third point, yeah, many of the chapters deal with authoritarian states, but some deal with self-proclaimed democratic states, the foundation of Israel, for example. Yet here too, we see a concept of national citizenship that is very much rooted in ethnic, uh, with a definition of ethnicity and religiosity and, and, and religion, even though of course there are uh, Israeli Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, still the definition of Israel as a state of the Jews proclaimed by the Knesset uh, two, two summers ago, but that has always been the case in Israel, shows how even democratic states function around inclusion and exclusion. So that's just quickly, but let me again th especially thank Catherine for, for those, not only for the accolades, but also for those uh, trenchant questions. And again, I, since Catherine held, held up my book, I'll, I'll hold up her book, which I have like five more pages to it, <laughs> her most recent book, which has opened my eyes into yet a, a, another side of human rights, the issue of responsibilities. Thank you. We are going to now open this up for question and answers. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to uh, exercise the co-chair prerogative uh, of posing a question of my own. And I, I 
want to ask you about something that you talk about in the book and that you talked about today, Eric. Uh, it's the definition question, or mm -hmm. rather the lack of definition. Uh, and to contemporary ears, uh, the phrase human rights, I think, uh, has something of a generally shared meaning in part shaped by the 48th UN Declaration on Human Rights, uh, which often refers to respect for the, quote, inherent worth and dignity of every person and the need for equality and justice, as you put it in the conclusion. And yet throughout you resist offering a core definition, insisting that human rights are dynamic, that their, quote, meaning has evolved over the past two and a half centuries. And in the introduction, you decline to offer a definitive answer to the ultimate question, the meaning of rights that has occupied philosophers, theologians, and political theorists for centuries. Instead, you explore the complexities of human rights and take an open-ended and capacious and practical approach to the term. Now, as I read the book, at times I thought your case studies equated human rights with rights in general, uh, and that all rights can ultimately in some way be folded into the term human rights. Now, if that's the case, and you may tell me that it's not, um, why not subtitle the book, The Global Struggle for Rights uh, in the Age of Nation States? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. And as I said, I, I prefer to see the continuities in the understanding of rights as they developed intellectually from the 17th century, politically and intellectually from the 18th century onward. And you know, at the Seneca Falls Declaration, there's talk of human rights. Frederick Douglass used the term human rights, if not often, at least occasionally. Uh, William, Ga William Lloyd Garrison, another famed American abolitionist, used the term human rights. So I think it's not, um, it's not incorrect then to apply the term even when it was not universally used because even in the 19th century, there's contestation, there's struggle about who is to be included in the circle of rights-bearing citizens. And to that extent, human, human rights has resonance through the 19th and early 20th century until its full articulation in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as I've learned from Catherine, and Catherine well knows, the Latin American uh, statement on human rights that preceded the UDHR by something like eight months. So, Therefore, um, be precisely because of the, the instability, the contestation over the term, I'm completely comfortable using it as an overarching term for this history as it evolved. And again, it's not a static history to be sure, uh, as it evolved from the 18th century onward. Thank you very much. So for those of you wanting to ask questions, please use the raise hand function uh, on Zoom. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can email uh, rweekly, that's R-W-H-E-A-T-L-E-Y at historians.org, uh, and uh, she'll pass the question on to us. So we have a number of people uh, in the queue. We're going to start off with Jeremy Popkin. Uh, if you could, sir, unmute yourself. Um, you can ask the question. Um, am I on? You are unmuted. In hello? Yes, hello. Hello? Oh, yes, uh, hello, uh, Professor Weitz. Uh, it will sound as if I'm uh, making a, um, uh, asking for a special status for my own uh, field of specialization. And you have, to some extent, uh, already conceded that uh, the late 18th century is a very important period for this history. But it seemed to me uh, when I uh, uh, started your book that uh, uh, I, I fully appreciate your desire to open the discussion up to a kind of global history, but uh, to leave out uh, the American and French revolutions and the movement for the abolition of slavery that uh, starts in that period uh, seems to me to uh, kind of uh, 
leave a very important part of the history of this discussion uh, in the dark. Uh, and uh, so I sort of want, wanted to uh, ask why you decided uh, uh, to simply omit that stage of the history of rights debates uh, and begin in the uh, 1820s. Well, those revolu revolutions, and I would include the Latin American revolutions along with the two that you mentioned, are the ever-present background in a sense, because there's constant reference back to them. There's reference back by, I mean, the Greek rebellion, again, to go back to that as an example, begins as a very traditional uh, insurgency against Ottoman taxations and other abuses that Greeks felt. It wasn't a national uh, rebellion in its origins, but pretty soon, uh, leading Greek political figures just realized that they could get some mileage in the European capitals if they related their actions to the ideas of the French Revolution. And the um, Recophiles like Lord Byron and others who, who went to Greece to support the Greek rebels thought of themselves as acting in the tradition of the French Revolution as well. So that is always present. Uh, there is a chapter that I mentioned very briefly on slavery and abolition in, in Brazil. So that does play a central role in the book. And I argue that um, slave rebellions helped destroy what was the, the greatest violation of any kind of human rights sensibility in the 19th century. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to call on Sonia Michelle. And if folks could identify themselves briefly uh, before they ask their question, we would appreciate it. Uh, so Sonia. Your Hi, question. thanks for taking my question. Uh, I'm a professor emerita of uh, women's history, mostly at the University of Maryland and currently painting. Um, Eric, sounds like a very interesting book, which I'm hoping you. a chance to read. Um, I have two sort of related questions. In what <coughs> sense is this a global history? I mean, are you just, I mean, or is it more sort of a compendium of cases that you're kind of comparing? And relatedly, this might give you a avenue into that question. Um, you. You, you start in the 17th century, which, me, which I take to mean that you think the ideas of the Enlightenment were important and had continuities throughout a number of the struggles for human rights. But when you listed the three factors, if I got this right, that were important, their movements, governments and governments slash states and international forces. So my question is to what extent were, was ideology important? Were, were ideas important? And given the fact that a number of the cases, as I, if I recall correctly, are non-Western, to what extent were the Western, the Western ideas of the Enlightenment important in the various cases that you examine? I think the uh, Enlightenment ideas were absolutely critical um, everywhere around the world. And um, you know, I've been roundly critiqued for, uh, a def for supposedly a Western-centric or Eurocentric history of human rights. And I, I, I contest that criticism because uh, as the idea of rights moved around the globe, it also expanded and became adapted to other situations. So for example, and it's a very critical example, the expansion of our understanding of rights to include social and economic rights was very much the actions of people in and movements in what we now call the global south. The creation, and just two examples to illuminate that, the creation of the global international human rights system after 1945 was by no means only the work of the United States and other liberal states, it was very much an alliance between the Soviet Union and the Global South uh, in fostering measures at the international level, like decolonization, like national independence, like social and economic rights in that, in human, in that UN convention that I mentioned. Now, 
you, one might argue that the Soviet Union was just a cynical actor here. And it's something I, I dispute in that chapter that there's a long tradition out of which the Soviet Union is is acting as well, you know, whatever it, 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 it's horrific domestic policies. So um, those ideas have their or human rights ideas have their origins in the Enlightenment, but they also get transformed as they move around the globe. And the the second example I would point to is that one of the first if not the very first human rights actions at the United Nations was the effort by the representative of India, Pandit Nehru, uh, Nehru's sister, to condemn South Africa for its policies of apartheid. So we see, so I think that history challenges both the notion that human rights is, are only a Western invention and therefore necessarily imperialist and show, demonstrate how the ideas of human rights evolve over the course of the 19th, 20th and into the 21st centuries. The book is a global history. I, I don't compare all the cases, though I do draw comparisons here and there where, or analogies here and there where it is appropriate. But uh, what I wanted to do in writing a global history is to key in on all the various political economies that prevailed in the 19th and 20th centuries from liberal to authoritarian states, uh, colonial settings to communist states. And that's the global character as well as the, ge uh, the geographic reach of the book. Thank you. Um, Michael Novak. If you would unmute yourself, you may pose a question. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Okay, first, um, well, thank you for letting me ask a question. Um, the one you, I remember you mentioned briefly the the close you mentioned. Well, this is the core of your book is the close relationship between human rights and the state, at least in the modern world. And you talk about the origins of human rights in the seven, being around the time of the Enlightenment. What is your response? Because I've heard other people argue. You know, I heard some people argue it starts with the Magna Carta. I've even heard some people starts with argue it starts with the Cyrus Cylinder and the Iron Age. What, are your, what is your response to those arguments? Yeah, look, we can, as some people have argued, it begins with the Hammurabi Code. Um, I think what one can say is that. Um, Virtually all systems of religious thought have moral and ethical principles that human rights draw from. Uh, we can also go back to Aquinas and that natural law, and many people do, and then the evolution of uh, and transformation of natural law in, in secularization of natural law in the Enlightenment. Um, but um, well, what, what is, is significant, again, is that in the 18th century, those ideas become manifest in politics, that they are no longer in the realm of theology and philosophy, but they become manifest in politics. And more than that, Rights give people a sense of power. So they're not just about, not only about what various systems of religious thought consider religiously and ethically correct, that we really provide a code of behavior for human beings, which is certainly important. I'm not gainsaying that in any moment. But rights give people a sense of power. It gives people a sense of dignity that they in do, indeed do have the ability to act in and to transform their world as they see necessary. And that empowering side of rights is marks it off from previous systems of thought, however humane, 
those previous systems may be. Thank you. Sarang Sidor, if you would unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Well, Professor Guides, thank you for a very interesting and enlightening talk. Um, my question is regarding what is now, we can now see an interesting and curious turn in the discourse over rights. In many countries, including the US or India or other countries as well, you're seeing majorities uh, claim that they are in fact uh, the ones who are oppressed uh, by minorities and therefore the rights discourse is articulated from the majoritarian standpoint. One example here in the United States is that of religious liberty, uh, an argument being used to deny LGBT communities rights or at least attempt uh, to deny them rights through the idea of religious freedom and there are many other such um, um, articulations out there, which uh, in many ways manifestly are anti-human rights, but nevertheless have, uh, in a sense, appropriated the language of rights for a very different purpose. So how does the human rights question, both academic and in terms of movements, confront this very different kind of challenge to what I would consider challenge to uh, the idea of human rights, which is perhaps much harder to tackle. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And unfortunately, it, it is quite true that the phrase human rights has become so prevalent in our current world that it is often appropriated and misappropriated for all sorts of limiting or even nefarious ideas. So fundamental to any conception of human rights is the dignity of the individual, as Eric mentioned in, in, in his comment and question. And if you don't recognize that all people, no matter what their sexual orientation, no matter what their ethnicity or nationality or race is, that all people have rights. If you don't recognize that, if you don't start from that premise, you're not really talking about human rights. That, and, and, and therefore, those who misappropriate the phrase need to be challenged in the public sphere and need to be challenged strongly, I would argue. Yeah, states are also great exemplars of those who have authoritarian states even, who have misappropriated the terminology of human rights and they need to be challenged when their authoritarian practices actually violate human rights. Uh, Eric, you might want to bring Catherine in here also because I imagine she would have things to say on this on this issue as well. Catherine? Not to put you on the spot. Unmute her. There we go. I Hi. would just add to this that um, that it it does speak to the success and power of human rights language that it previously groups that would have just used a discrimination frame and, and been free, felt free to display their, their biases, um, instead feel that they, they must frame their arguments in terms of, of freedom of religion, for example, right? Uh, and, but that raises for us issue that rights claims always come in, in conflict with other rights claims. You know, they're, they're, and so uh, those issues, I think, ha some of those issues have to be dismissed and some of them have to be put back in the context of longstanding debates over what do we do when one person's rights come into, 
in conflict with another person's rights. And I think the standard answer there is that, yes, you have a right to religion. And there's a lot of important work that needs to be done to protect people's right to religion, for example. Uh, I personally think, for example, that the right to of, of French schoolgirls to wear headscarves if they want, is we should protect their right to practice their religion and be allowed to do that. What that doesn't permit you to do is violate the rights of others. Right. And so the dilemma is that people making arguments saying my religion, I, I need to protect my religion, are using it to justify violating the, the rights of other people, discriminating against the rights of others. And, that, and that's you sort of say, no, you have a right, but your right has limits when it uh, violates the rights of others. Yeah. If I may, Eric, continue uh, in that line um, to bring it very much into the present also with this. You know, crazy debate we have in the United States about wearing masks. Well, you know, people say it's my individual right. Well, sorry, no, it's not. There is no religious, moral, ethical system in the world. There's no human rights system in the world that says you have the right to harm others. And to bring back Catherine's new book, The Hidden Face of Rights Towards a Politics of Responsibilities, there is, has to be, a social understanding of responsibilities that go along with an understanding of human rights. Human rights are not absolute. Thank you. Uh, Ilhan Kagri, uh, if you would unmute yourself. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, my question is about uh, democratic governance. Um, you had mentioned the case of Israel, which while giving rights to a portion of their population, denies full rights to other Israeli citizens who are not the right kind. Uh, we saw a similar situation in apartheid South Africa. So in thinking about Israel and um, apartheid South Africa, could you please speak more about how it's possible to talk about a democratic government in the modern sense, while that government serves to suppress a large portion of its own population? and indeed sometimes creates a zone whereby the population therein lacks access to even the most basic rights, uh, such as access to civilian courts. And in fact, can't you argue that uh, those governments actually serve to enrich and empower maybe small subsections of the privileged population while using the pretext of a supremacist ideology to obfuscate what's really going on? Well, yes and yes. <laughs> Um, and sometimes it's not a small subset, sometimes it's a large subset. Uh, in South Africa, it was a small subset of the population, the white population. Uh, in Israel, you have, you know, uh, uh, since 1948, the, the, the majority, and it's in, in numerical terms, the majority of the population um, that indeed is more privileged, is more rights bearing than the Palestinian part of the population. Um, one of the one of my goals in the chapter on Palestine Israel was to quote unquote normalize the history of, Pal of the Palestinian Israeli conflict. That is not not to normalize, of course, in the sense of making it all just fine, but normalize it in the sense that these conflicts over who has the right to bear rights. Though these conflicts are longstanding. They emerge with the emergence of the nation state and one very blatant and sometimes brutal manifestation of, the, of that is indeed Palestine, Israel. So any self-proclaimed democracy, look, the United States was a self-proclaimed democracy when it was the slaveholding nation uh south africa proclaimed itself as as a democracy israel proclaims itself as a democracy um those three cases are not all the same but one has to look deeply at where the limitations of democracy exist when the state and citizenship are defined in exclusive terms thank you uh, Gary Cohen, uh, <laughs> unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, Gary. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Uh, I am Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Minnesota, so I'm a former colleague of both Eric uh, and Catherine Sickink. Uh, Eric, uh, let me ask an historian's question. Uh, I imagine not a very hard one. Uh, you mentioned in your talk uh, how the uh, establishment of the, of the United Nations, uh, the issuing of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in 1948 are commonly taken as uh, uh, opening a, a new era uh, and a new regime uh, for international human rights protection. And then you went on to say that in this, this book, uh, you were interested in finding the longer term continuities rather than uh, drawing a strict demarcation uh, at 1948. Uh, that being the case, let me ask uh, what you see as the import or lack thereof of the beginnings of uh, efforts at international protection of minority rights. We see a little bit of this with the Congress of Berlin in 1878 uh, regarding the emerging Balkan nations. And then uh, more formally, uh, 19, 1918, 1919, with the Paris Peace Conference, the minority treaties uh, that the League of Nations was supposed to help enforce. Uh, how much of a watershed in uh, an international human rights regime do you think that marked or not? Or was it in some ways perhaps a false start? Thank you. I think the period from 1878 to 1945, rights were defined in Europe primarily around nation states and national belonging. That is, national citizenship came first, the individual after that. The UDHR proclaimed uh, in the, straddled the, the issues in the sense that it is largely a document about individual human rights because everyone recognized the abject failure of the minority protection system established at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. There were a few voices, mostly representatives of Jewish organizations, who wanted to see a recreation of the minority protection system, but those voices uh, were very few and, and failed. Nonetheless, one cannot say that the UDHR is exclusively a document about individuals because there are, in the last 10 or so ar articles of the UDHR, there is attentiveness to social and economic rights, there's also attentiveness to national belonging. So while there is a shift in uh, post-1945 toward a greater emphasis on individual rights, it's not a complete shift, not by any means. And the subsequent history, for example, the debates that ran on for 20 years almost prior to the two UN conventions of 1966 about self-determination, self-determination by this point clearly understood as a collective right, a right of nationals, a right of the nation state, demonstrates that that history of a collective understand, a primarily collective understanding of human rights did not by any means die with 1945, even though no, almost no one wanted to recreate the minority protection system of the League of Nations. And Donna, Donna, uh, if you would unmute yourself. <clears throat> yes? Yes. You can go ahead. I didn't ask the question. I'm sorry. I'm a, oh. <laughs> I'm a late comer to listening in. I'm sorry I missed the early part. It sounds like you've been having a very good conversation. I do not have a question at this okay. time. The hand, the hand was up, so I called on it, but since you're a latecomer, just be advised, the recording of this session will be up on our respective websites shortly. Uh, 
Herman Cohen. If you could unmute yourself. Yes, uh, thank you for that very interesting discussion. I'm a retired U.S. Foreign Service officer, served a lot in Africa, so I know a lot about human rights issues. In the advanced capitalist societies like the United States, where there's great wealth disparity, and we saw that in the pandemic where people found, found it very hard to miss even a single paycheck, aren't we getting to the point where poverty for working people is becoming a human right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I would say it's, the issue has been there before. Uh, the notion, the concept of social and economic rights has existed beforehand, as I said, at least since 1966, formally, but it certainly goes back earlier. Uh, and COVID-19 has laid bare the huge inequalities within countries and globally, between the global north and the global south. So it does drive home the point how critical it is for social and economic inequalities to be incorporated into a system of rights and you know, not just through proclamations and treaties like the 1966 convention, but actually through policies that address the stark inequalities that exist and make it very difficult for people to access rights at all. Again, I don't know if Catherine wants to jump in here and say some things. I don't want to put you on the spot, but... <laughs> I'll need to unmute you. Good. Not at all. Uh, and I was just actually pulling up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, article of 1948, Article 25. It says exactly as uh, uh, our, the questioner said, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services and the right to security in an event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. And so I feel like that um, was that notion of, of it, it wasn't a right not to be poor, but it was a right to an adequate standard of living, in, including in these circumstances beyond people's control uh, like we are under today. I am going to take this opportunity. I have a million questions, but I will just pose a few. And I would like you to talk a bit more about your case study, Eric, uh, of the Soviet Union. Um, and say something about the distinction between the substance of human rights and the rhetoric of human rights. And so this, this came to mind when I was reading this chapter in, in particular, uh, the language of Soviet leaders and Soviet constitutions were, as you say, bracingly democratic and rights oriented uh, for all of the USSR's diverse peoples. Uh, and yet, as we all know, and as you make abundantly clear uh, in the history of the Soviet Union, we have state-induced famines, forced population removals, Stalinist terrors, and so forth and so on. You ask a question, can we even talk about human rights in a system that was as bloodily repressive that killed and tortured and deported millions of its own citizens, unquote. And your answer is yes, we can talk about rights while recognizing the quote, deeply repressive and murderous character of the system. This makes sense to me with regard to the activists that you end the chapter with, who use the language of rights that Soviet leaders and constitutions talked about, um, at least in theory, to use it against the, the system itself. Um, but the sense that I got, given your own emphasis that rights are meaningless without political rights to back them up, what the state gives you say, the state can take away. And in the case of the Soviet Union, the social and economic rights that existed through its many decades were illusory. They weren't really rights at all um, because they could be and were taken away uh, at various points in time. 
So if you could just talk a little bit more about the Soviet case uh, and how we think about human rights with regard to its leaders' proclamations and the system's own kind of ideological statements uh, of what it stood for. Okay. There are a couple of ways in which this operates. Um, and it might, might, may seem counterintuitive at first glance, but I think not actually. First of all, the Soviet leaders, Stalin included, were steeped in the history of the socialist and communist movement, steeped in the texts of Marx and Engels, steeped in the history of the French Revolution. And there was a previous question about our, whether I consider idea, whether ideas are important. Yes, I consider ideas are critically important. And they viewed their movement, <laughs> whatever the you know, terrorist actions that, you know, you just quoted uh, that passage from the book, they viewed their movement as the fulfillment of the French Revolution. Now, many people know, of course, that Marx railed against human rights, but uh, I, I, I think a more more robust understanding of Marx and Engels is that they railed against the limitations of rights in a bourgeois capitalist world. And they understood communism as the fulfillment of rights. And, you know, I think, you know, until we get to the utter cynicism perhaps of Brezhnev and, 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 and his successors until uh, in between him and Gorbachev uh, in the, uh, in the 1970s that they, they, they took those ideas seriously. And those ideas provided the basis then for the Soviet Global South Alliance that I mentioned previously. Because the idea of self-determination, uh, it doesn't show up in, in Marx's major theoretical writing, but it does show up in Marx and Engels' journalistic writings, the right of nations to establish themselves, the right of nations under imperial domination to rebel against the imperial power. That then provided um, a basis for the creation of the Soviet Global South Alliance. So uh, what I'm arguing here is that what the Soviets do on the international level was critical to the creation of the post-1945 human rights system, despite what the regime did domestically. And, you know, there are, that's not unique. Uh, for, for the Soviet Union, for, uh, for states anywhere in the world. The second way this works is I, I would modify a bit the way you described the Soviet dissident and human rights movement, because in the beginning, they are acting out of that same belief system. I mean, this, the Stalin constitution was probably the most democratic in the world, issued in 1936, uh, just as the terror in the Soviet, the Great Terror is is beginning on paper, um, you know, completely more more democratic than anything else, and the first human rights activists in the Soviet Union drew on that constitution very courageously. Some people thought they were absolutely insane <laughs> to do so, but they said, "We have rights. It's right here. It says so. The state should just do." what it has committed itself to do and the succeeding uh, constitution under Brezhnev uh, did all, also included all these rights. So they were not operating out of a classically liberal understanding of rights, but out of a classically socialist and communist understanding of rights. And only when the repression became so great in the 1970s and early 1980s and the conditions seemed so hopeless for the dissident and human rights movement, did they actually turn to, I think what we can say is a more liberal understanding of rights. The third way in which this functioned is that uh, the activism of the, the few and very you know, heroic Soviet dissidents galvanized the human rights movement in the West. And Arya Nair, for example, one of the icons of the civil rights movement, uh, of the human rights movement, 
writes about this in, in, in his book, The History of the Human Rights Movement and Amnesty International, and what would began as Helsinki Watch and then evolved into Human Rights Watch. They were galvanized in the 1970s and 80s by two issues in particular, the Soviet human rights movement and the anti-apartheid movement. So there we see the ways in which ideas and movements travel internationally, get adapted and mobilized in different ways. These are the kind of transnational networks that Catherine wrote about and, and earlier in the 1990s that were so crucial to the development of the human rights movement. Thank you. Alyssa Bivens, your hand is up. If you would unmute and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Hi, my name is Alyssa. I'm a PhD student at George Washington University. And hello, Professor Arneson. Uh, good to see you. Um, I uh, have a question about sort of the way that nation states might look moving forward. I know looking to the future as a historian can, can be daunting, um, but you've sort of mentioned this is an affirmative history of human rights and that states, we, we can't live with them, we can't live without them, you said, but I guess my question is sort of uh, a little flippantly, why can't we? Um, if city states and sort of kingdoms, empires have all passed, um, why are nation states necessarily the best vehicle for human rights if, as you've noted, they've, they've had a, a troubled uh, road up to today. Um, and thank you again for your time. And I look forward to more deeply reading your book for my comprehensive exams this semester. So thank you. Thank you. You know, whenever I get questions about the future, I start out, and I'll start out here by telling people in October 1989, I was just back from the German Democratic Republic on a research trip. And I told the class in German history, no less, that the, the Berlin Wall would be with us for the rest of our lives. Well, two weeks later, whoosh, all gone. <laughs> okay, so you might not want to uh, trust my predictive abilities here. But I'll, uh, since you ask, <laughs> I'll, I'll make a stab at it nonetheless. Uh, it's hard to imagine, or at least I find it hard to imagine, a world without nation states. You know, after um, the collapse of communism and uh, neoliberalism and the emergence of, and, and, and a new form of globalization, you know, there are all sorts of ideas that the nation state was on, all, all sorts of expressions that the nation state was on the wane and all of that. Uh, that has not proven to be the case. I never took that seriously at the time. If there's something different down the road, I certainly can't see it. Global citizenship is a nice idea, but in practice, we are citizens of nation states. Even in the European Union, which has the most advanced regional protection of rights through the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court on Human Rights, you still have to be a citizen of a European state to get full access to rights. Now, non-state non holding, non-citizenship holding people do have some rights in the EU, uh, thanks to the development since 1945, but um, you still have to be a citizen of a, uh, an EU member state to become a full-fledged citizen, full-fledged rights-bearing citizen. So I'm not sure that nation states are the best vehicle for rights, but they're the ones we've got right now. <laughs> and the struggle is always to make them more democratic, make them more respectful of human rights at the same time that we expand human rights protections at the international level. I see Catherine has raised her hand. If we could unmute Catherine. There we go. Um, okay, but I wanna push just a step further because you keep talking about the nation state as if all states in the world were nation states where most states in the world aren't actually nation states. And the, so the, the quandary I have is that 
peoples continue to demand nation states. And so, you know, what happened in the Balkans, you know, got all split up into what they tried to make nation states. And, uh, um, we had, uh, you know, in Israel, Palestine, there's still the demand for a Palestinian state, even as it becomes increasingly more difficult to imagine. And in Syria, at one point, they were having talks of how they were going to partition Syria into various nation states. But there are a lot of other models out there of multinational states uh, or, or states nations, I think as Alfred Stefan called them, which is a, a very different model than a nation state. And so can't you, you know, we don't have to talk about co uh, co global citizenship. Can't we talk about organizing uh, states in such a way that they're not nation states and they are providing protections for all of their diverse uh, citizens? I mean, that's certainly true. There are other models. There are federal models. There's, there's Indonesia, there's Switzerland. Um, the United States, how one defines the United States is always a bit of a quandary. <laughs> uh, I, I think the Soviet Union was a federation of nationalities, which is why I included it in the book. But even those places that are federal systems or clearly recognize the existence of minorities within the state ultimately demand loyalty to that state as the primary category of, uh, uh, of citizenship. So that says to me at least that the nation state model is powerfully present even in federal systems or something other than clearly exclusive nation states. Thank you. We have one last hand up. Lynn Romberg, if you would unmute yourself. Lynn? You will need to unmute yourself. Going once, <laughs> going twice. Well, then let me pose a very simple and straightforward question that's been on my mind. The case studies that you offer are all kind of self-contained, you know, linked with the, the theme that carries the book through, uh, and they're all equally fascinating. I'm wondering if you could just talk very quickly about your selection process and what case studies you thought about including that you didn't include and why? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, um, I wanted case studies that stretched the globe geographically and that also represented the range of political economies that seemed to me to prevail in the 19th and 20th centuries from de liberal democratic to authoritarian, from colonial systems to communism. I had intended originally to write a chapter on partitions that would cover India, Pakistan, Palestine, Israel, and Rwanda, Burundi, even though Africanists tell me Rwanda and Burundi was not really a partition. And there's some basis to that for sure. I just I couldn't do it all <laughs> in, in one chapter. I, I, I did some serious amount of research on India, Pakistan, but that just, you know, in the end got, got thrown out. Um, and it helped enormously to have friends and colleagues who are specialists on these other areas. Uh, where I did not have the linguistic capacity, nor did I have much background. And as Korea is a good example, Greece is a good example. So it's good to have friends and colleagues. Indeed. Uh, and with that, uh, I will say thank you to both Eric and Catherine and turn this over to Christian Osterman. Thanks, Eric, for moderating this terrific discussion. Let me remind all of our viewers that we will not meet at our regular time next week, but convene again on Friday, October 2nd, featuring 
for a session that will feature Pulitzer Prize winning historian and Wilson Center alumnus Martin Sherwin and his new book, Gambling with Armageddon, Nuclear Roulette from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis, published earlier this summer. Let me also thank Eric and Catherine for the wonderful, very thoughtful, in-depth discussion. Thanks to everyone out there for joining us. Until next time, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.